Believe it or not, I'm going to start by importing a box, which I have modeled, well, created in 3D Studio Max because, and you might be wondering, well, why, why, why? Why would you have to do that? And the reason is because ZBrush's box is awfully awesome in that it has a massive pole right here in the box and on two sides of it. So it's utterly useless for sculpting in most situations. Now there must be a way in Almighty ZBrush to get yourself a box without importing it from another program, but I don't know how to do it. So I imported my very own handcrafted box and subdivided it a few times. And now we're ready to start sculpting our rock. But before we start sculpting anything, let's be sure that we have adequate reference imagery. And we do. Here it is. So I very often start with clay buildup. I actually prefer clay buildup to the standard brush. Um, I pretty much use clay buildup as a standard brush. And I know a lot of people do prefer it for their general form sculpting. Our first goal here is to make our box look like a rock very generally though. So we're just going for the big general form here and we want that form to look dynamic and interesting. And also, of course, we want it to resemble our reference rocks, but don't spend too much time on this stage. This is just a really quick get the basic shape. I mean, this stage is important, but it shouldn't take long. It should be really quick, really loose. Don't get caught up on the details. There, done. Took me a few minutes. Moving on. Now we want to give our rock some big uh, flat planes like our reference has. And to do that, we're going to use the clip curve tool. Now this is a really weird tool to use at first, but once you get used to it, it's actually still really weird. So this tool doesn't work like a brush. To use it, you hold down control and shift and click and drag, then let go of control and shift, but still click and drag and sequentially tap alt to change its direction. And then it'll just lop off a big section of your sculpt. So again, that's hold, control, and shift, and drag to start it, and then tap Alt sequentially to change its direction. And you'll notice there is that black shadow on one side of the dotted line, and that is supposed to tell you which direction it's going to lop. But as you saw just there, sometimes it just does whatever it wants, and you simply have to do it again. But usually, that black shadow is indeed the direction it's going to lop. But every once in a while, it lops the wrong way. So right there, that was just me accidentally doing it from the wrong side. So if you want it to actually lop, lop the other side, then you can just drag it from the other side. It It's kind of hard to explain, but if you guys just mess around with it, you'll see what I mean. Just keep in mind that the black shadowing is the direction it's going to lop. You hold Control and Shift and drag to start it, and then let go of Control and Shift and continue dragging, and then sequentially tap Alt to, to change its direction. It's pretty weird, but it's uh, it's pretty cool. It's just hard to control. <laughs> so you see I'm adding these big uh, flat planes here, which are going to make our, th our uh, rock look a lot more rocky. We definitely don't want rounded, rounded blobbiness, because rounded blobbiness is not the kind of rock we're going for. Rounded blobby rocks are actually a rare type of rock found in northern Ukraine, but that is not the kind we're making. Now that I've made a few of these clips, I'm going to switch to the Trim Dynamic brush, which is a really good brush for flattening out planes. So some of the clips I made were kind of curvaceous, and I don't really want that. So I'm using Trim Dynamic to flatten them out, but also you can use Trim Dynamic just to flatten out some of the blobbier parts. So I just went up a subdivision level, which um, is going to allow me to get some sharper edges going here. So I always kind of look at the silhouette of the rock. You can see me kind of rotating and trying to never have like a, a rounded silhouette like on on any part of the rock because the kind of rocks that we're making, at least the ones in my reference, don't really do that. They're kind of every every feature of the silhouette is like a straight lines, if that makes any sense. So I'm just going around looking at this thing from all different angles and trying to work out 
basically make it look faceted is the goal here. But really take care in not killing your sharp angles because when I started out, I had a tendency to facet some of the sharp, some of the sharper angles and then facet those angles. And what I ended up with is a rounded, although faceted shape. But you don't want that, you know, you want real sharp angles throughout these rocks. So uh, just now I changed my material to matte cap gray because it's a little bit easier to see what, what's going on than that standard red material. And I actually recommend changing that material right at the beginning, but I always forget to do that. I'm also taking note not to kill some of these divots I'm getting, those little indents, because I think they look kind of cool, look kind of rocky. And we are done with this rock. Now you'll notice it's not very detailed at all. It doesn't have a whole lot of texture. I didn't use a bunch of alphas or anything to get this surface really rocky. And that's because it really is for this application, which is going to be, uh, these rocks are going to go to CryEngine. I'm actually not going to use a macro normal. This rock right now, this high poly, all I'm going to do is decimate it. And then it's going to go over to max and it's never going to be used as a high poly normal map baked. So it really doesn't make any sense to go hyper detailed because it's going to all be lost uh, once we decimate it. And I have made a lot of these kinds of rocks before. And in my experience, uh, spending extra time to do extra detail really buys you nothing. If you were baking a normal map from this high poly, then yeah, sure, go crazy detail, but we're not. So I would recommend to not waste your time if if you're going to be authoring these rocks the same way I am. So now we're going to go ahead with the decimation. You're going to click on Z plugin here and under decimation mat master, which I already have expanded right here, you're just going to, uh, the first thing you need to do is actually pre-process current, but I have already done that. And now that I have done that, I can choose the number of polygons that I want to decimate down to. You can choose it as a percentage or just below that you can choose K of polys which is uh, thousands of polys, and then you're just going to click decimate current, and then it'll show you what your uh, thing looks like decimated. And then you can you can change the number right now. It's not too late. It doesn't like destroy it or anything. But don't save your Z tool right now. If you do that, then it won't remember all of the higher levels. But right now we can, it's still remembering the higher version, so we can continue to find a good balance of polygons. And I'm just trying out different ones, different uh, amounts to see kind of the trade off of what is going to get me the most detail and what kind of detail I can afford to lose. And I think I've struck a pretty good balance of detail here at about a thousand triangles. So I'm going to go ahead and export this as an OBJ. And I like all my intermediate files to be in the same folder as my final file. So I'm just going to export as rock one into my Boulder clusters 02 folder. Now we're simply making another rock. Um, I, it, I'm going to use the exact same process. So I'm just going to jam through this one at super high speed. I'm just going to try to make the shape different. So think of this as a little recap of everything we learned in the first rock. I'm going to try to make this one a little bit crazier, I guess, a little bit more dynamic, but it's the exact same thing. Just clay build up to get the very rough form. And now I've moved on already to the um, clip curve to get those facets. And then at the end, we're going to be using the trim dynamic to uh, polish things up and stuff. So we're going to end up making three rocks here and the goal is to make them look, you know, polished from all sides so that we can turn them about and create a few cluster variants out of just these three rocks. And then we'll export each of these clusters we create as props into CryEngine. We'll have a whole set of rock or boulder clusters or whatever you want to call them that we can propagate around and fill out our world with. So I'm not going to show me making the third rock because it's going to be the exact same process we just saw twice now. 
but it's just a basically just a smaller a smaller more kind of simple little rock because this one is kind of big and has a lot of different cuts and stuff in it and the other one was also a little bit more dramatic so I just wanted to make a smaller simple one now you don't have to have like three rocks it's not like three rocks to make a boulder cluster you can have as many as you want I just think three is going to be enough to give us some good variation Keep in mind that since about half the rock is going to be buried into the ground, we can each rock is going to be good for quite a few different angles and it'll look completely different sticking up out of the ground at a completely different angle. So that'll allow a lot more variation than you'd think. Boom, done. Decimated it to a low poly. Took about 15 minutes of real time. And now I am going to export this OBJ. And in the next video, we'll be in 3ds Max, unwrapping these guys, giving them a texture, and actually making them into cute little formations.